Hey folks, welcome to lesson 11 of Software Design and Development for National 5 Computing Science. Last time we took our first look at conditional loops and we're going to do that again today. I'm going to show you a different way of using conditional loops and then I'll set you a challenge. Next time we're going to look at these predefined functions, but today let's stick with conditional loops. So let's go to Replit. I've got a new Replit. I've called this Conditional Loop 2 because this is the second way that I want to show you how to use conditional loops. Last time we used a conditional loop, it was to make sure that the user's age was within two values, so they had to be between 18 and 30. We did that by saying, while age is less than 18, or age is greater than 30, tell them to try again. And this is a basic rundown of what we did last time. We got an age, and if it was too low, we told them to try again. If it was too high, we told them to try again. If it was within the range, it's fine, it just exited. So that was the last time. A conditional loop using a complex condition. Here we have it. This time what I'd like to do is create a different program. So this one's just going to do some simple maths and we're going to ask the user to enter a couple of numbers, do some sort of mathematical equation, but if the user wants to continue, we will loop again and offer them the chance to do another mathematical equation. It sounds a, a bit more complicated than it's going to be. Let me show you how you do it. So first off, we need a variable that's going to be used to control the loop. I'm going to call this one again. And if we want to go again, the user will type in yes. So what we can say is while again equals yes, then we are going to perform what is inside this loop. So what are we going to do in this loop? Well, I said we're going to ask for two numbers. So we're going to have number one equals, I'm just going to use whole numbers, int input, enter, number one. And we'll do the same, I'll copy and paste, but this is going to be number two. Copying and pasting is good in programming, but only if it's your own code that you're copying and pasting. Obviously when you become a professional developer, you can copy and paste anyone's code. <laughs> but in school, make sure it's only your own code that you're copying. But it's okay to do it because it's your own code. It's not like you're copying someone else's work, it's your own work, you're just repeating it. All right, so what are we doing with these? So the answer is going to be number one to the power of number two, Nothing fancy. And then we're going to print the answer. And I'll just add a little uh, a little message first. So what I'm going to say is the string version of num1 plus to the power of the string version of number 2 plus and equals. And then I'm going to add the string version of the answer. I'm going to move this along so we've got more room to see the code. Here we are. So look at what's happening here. We're going to start a loop, and while again equals yes, I'm going to get a number from the user, get another number from the user. I'm going to find an answer by raising number one to the power of number two. I'm then going to say number one to the power of number two equals number one to the power of number two, the answer. Now, if I run this, what's going to happen? Well, let's take a look. It's going to ask me for two numbers. There we are. And it automatically just continues, and it keeps going and it's never going to stop. This is what's called an infinite loop. It's never going to stop. It will loop infinitely. Now, why is this? It's because we will loop while again is equal to yes. Again is always equal to yes. We're never giving the user the chance to change this value. So let's ask them, do they want to change it? So what we do is we overwrite again. So we reset it with a new input from the keyboard, and we ask, do you want to go again? Something like that. And I'm going to indicate that it's a yes or no question and leave a space there. So now what it's going to do is pretty much the same thing, but between the questions and the results, it's going to ask us if we want to continue. So let's do two to the power of five, and it gives us the answer. Do you want to continue again? I'm going to write yes, because I do. And we ask for another couple of numbers. And do we want to continue? Now, because it's only checking if yes is what again equals, I could type anything and it will stop. It will only continue if again is equal to yes. So this is another way you can use a conditional loop. We're using a question that the user answers to control whether we continue through the loop or not. So that was just a quick example. Let's have another challenge. And I'll explain how to complete the challenge in a minute. So first, here's the challenge. Write a program that asks the user for how many items they want to buy. The number of items must be between one and five, so you're gonna to have to use a while loop here. There's a clue. Ask the user for the cost of each item one at a time, then add that cost to a running total. 
the cost of each item must be between one penny and ten pounds. If the total cost is over thirty pounds, give the user five pounds discount. This is going to be an if statement. And finally, display the total to the user at the end. So pause the video, give it a go. I'll give you five seconds and I'll lead you through how to solve it. All right, how do we solve this one? Well, first of all, we do need to ask the user how many items they want to buy. So that's going to be uh, num items equals, and it's a whole number because you can't buy half items. Input enter the number of items you'd like to buy. There we are. Now, the number of items must be between one and five. So what we do is what we did in the previous lesson. We say while num items is less than one or num items is greater than five. So while the answer is out with the bounds that we've set, then we get the number of items again. I'm just going to copy and paste this. Copy, paste. Um, but I'll change the message and I'll say try again must be between 1 and 5. Spelling is very difficult for me. Okay, so so far we have gotten a number of items and made sure it's between 1 and 5. What's next? Ask the user for the cost of each item one at a time. Well, how do we do that? How do we know how many items we're buying? Well, we could just say item 1 equals float input what's the cost of item one and then put in the pound sign but what if they type in three items what if they type in five what if they type in two we can't create a varying number of variables so what we need to do is use a fixed loop so we know before we start looping how many items they want to buy because they've typed it in already so what we can say is for x in range num items remember what this does this will loop this many times. So num items could be a number between one and five. Let's say it's one, it will loop one time. If it's five, it'll loop five times. Now what do we do? We get the cost of an individual item. And we'll just do this once each time around the loop and we'll add that cost to a running total. So the cost equals a float because look, it can be decimal numbers. And we're getting it as an input from the keyboard and we'll say enter the cost of item and what item are we looking at? Well, x contains a number in this range. Remember, ranges start from zero and have this many numbers. So num items, if it's five, it'll go zero, one, two, three, four. Always stops one less than that one. But because it includes zero, it's that many items. Enter the cost of item str x plus one. Do you remember doing this in the fixed loops program? And then I'm gonna add a colon, a space, and a pound sign because it's a cost. Okay. Now what do we do? We add this cost to a running total. But we don't have a total yet. I mean, we could say total equals cost, or we could try and say total equals total plus cost, but what we're going to run into is accessing a variable that has not yet been created yet. Not yet been created yet. Yeah, that's perfect sense. So this variable doesn't exist until this line of code, so we can't refer to it in this line of code. We have to create it beforehand. So we'll do it up here. We'll say total equals zero, because before we've started adding things to the total, the total is going to be zero. What's next? We've gotten a cost of an individual item, and we've added that to the total, and then we're looping again. That seems fine. I think this for loop is finished. So we've got our total, but we need to check. If the total is over £30, give them a £5 discount. Okay, what we say is... If total is greater than 30, then... Now, we could we could type 30.00, but 30.00, in the computer's mind, is exactly the same as 30, so we don't need to. So if the total is greater than 30, then we give them a £5 discount. How do we do that? We say total equals total minus 5. Easy peasy. Barzo watfe. Final instruction. Display the total to the user at the end. Print. Your total is, and then a pound sign. I'm going to add on the string version of the total. Woo! What a beast. Now, what do you do when you write a program? Do you just save it and hand it in? Do you just file it away for later use? No, you run it. You check it. You test it. You make sure it actually works. So let's say the number of items we want to buy is zero. Can you buy zero items? I mean, you can buy nothing, but it's going to tell us. Try again. I'm not going to let you run through this checkout without actually buying something. 
So let's do six items. Too many. We'll only let users buy between one and five items. All right, let's do three. Beautiful. Enter the cost of item one. Well, let's say 50 quid. Hang on a minute. 50 quid? That's way too expensive. Didn't we say that it must be between one penny and 10 pounds? Why is this happening? It's because I didn't do a while loop here. When I get the cost, I need to make sure it is within this range. So let's interject here. Let's go here. While cost is less than 0 0.01, because that's the smallest price, or the cost is greater than, and remember, we don't need to do the decimals here because 10.00 is the same as 10. Then what do we do? We get a new cost. So let's copy this line. We're being efficient. And instead of just saying enter the cost of item, I'll say try again. Same as before, try again. Must be between 0 0.01 and 10. Let's run it again, see if it works. Now I'm not gonna bother testing this part. I can use a normal number. So three items, enter the cost. Let's try 50 again. Ha ha, now it's working. Try again, must be between one penny and 10 pounds. Beautiful. Let's try free. Let's see if we can get something for free. Nope, because that's less than a penny. Okay, let's buy something for a penny. That's way too small. Tenth of a penny. And let's try something for 10 pounds. Beautiful. Okay, and it's counting the numbers pr properly as well. One, two, and three. And let's do one for seven pounds 50. Oh no, we've run into that error again. So, so this is a problem with how computers store floating point numbers. Again, this is too advanced for National 5 Computing Science and we don't have the time to go over it. Sometimes you'll run into these problems. Just accept it. It is correct. Just round this up to the nearest penny. So it should be £17.51, which is correct. 10 plus 7.50 plus a penny uh, here. Perfect. So there you have it. This is how you solve this problem that I set you. I hope you were close. I hope you actually nailed it. Hope you nailed it. If not, don't worry. It's all about practice, practice, practice. So get practicing and I'll see you in the next one.